It's such a joy to celebrate these days as a church family. Amen. You know, today is Palm Sunday, right? And um, it's a day that is celebrated throughout Christian tradition in uh, all sorts of places. And it's a day that's really marked with irony and hope, which is kind of a weird combination, right? Jesus was fulfilling a prophecy. And so in this day, we recognize not only the work that Christ was instituting uh, then and there as he... uh, made his way into Jerusalem, the work that would come on the cross, but we also recognize the work of God throughout history, that God told, started telling this story at the beginning of time. And so we see in Jesus fulfilling this prophecy of Zechariah, we see the work of God in all of human history, right? Jesus, uh, Zechariah, 500 years earlier, said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew tells us that the people honored Jesus. The crowds that went up ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. These people were quoting Psalm 118, a psalm understood by the Jewish people to be a prophecy of the Messiah. And so the religious leaders really resented this. And Luke tells us that some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus saw no need to rebuke those who told the truth. And so he replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, Even the rocks will cry out. What a powerful moment in history. As readers, we know what will soon happen. How quickly everything will change. In just a few days, the shouts of Hosanna will turn to crucify, crucify, and they will. You know, crucifixion was a torturous way to die, reserved only for the worst criminals, the people that the Romans really wanted to make an example of. When we imagine crucifixion, many of us may well picture the nails being driven to Jesus' wrists and to his ankles. You might see him hanging there on the cross, beaten and bloody, surrounded by mockers yelling, if you are the Christ, come down from the cross and we'll believe in you then. He saved others, but he cannot save himself. We may see Jesus alone, deserted by his disciples. Well, most of his disciples. As Jesus hung there, he was not absolutely alone. We're told in the Gospels that four women were there with him and his beloved disciple, whom we know to be John. Listen to our scripture this morning from John Chapter 19, verses 25 to 27. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the disciple took her into his home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Father, as we come to your word, we know that it is life-giving, that it is life-transforming. And as we think about your work on the cross, what you were doing at each step as we looked at uh, everything that you have said from the cross, and as we come to this today, We pray that you would help us to have a deeper understanding of how it is that we see the glory of God in this passage, in our lives as we respond to it, and how it is that we can look to Mary and John, your faithful disciples, to help us understand what it means to live life in your community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I want to look closely at Mary and John to see what these Uh, final words of Jesus teach us about our relationship with Christ and our relationship with each other because of Jesus. All four Gospels have the same basic outline of the Passion narrative. The Passion narrative is the last week of Christ's life. 
Jesus was arrested near Jerusalem, he was tried and convicted, and he was executed on a cross. All of the Gospels offer uh, many consistent details, but they also emphasize aspects of Jesus' final days differently. John's account is very uh, focused. It's very sparse. He doesn't dwell on Jesus' own agony except for his thirst just before his death. Instead, John describes the activity swirling around Jesus, showing how it all relates to the glory of God. Because the theological emphasis of John's gospel is that Jesus is not a victim, but voluntarily he is sovereign on the cross. And so he has voluntarily chosen this fate, and he has control. So there's purpose every step of the way. Jesus' death on the cross is not only about the return of the king to heaven, but also about Jesus' care for his flock, his sacrifice, and the work of the Holy Spirit opening up new possibilities for spiritual life and renewal. Jesus is not just securing eternal life for those who call him Lord through his death and resurrection. He is teaching us how to live as followers of Christ and children of God. This is what Jesus has been about doing since he began his public ministry, right? In that ministry, he began by forming a new community, a strange new community. A community made up of tax collectors and formerly demon-possessed people, doctors and fishermen, political radicals, people with anger issues, doubters and former prostitutes, Gentiles, Jews, and Samaritans, women, men, old, young, the educated, the uneducated, even extroverts and introverts enjoying each other's company. Totally happens. (laughs) Rich and poor, you and me. This is a community characterized by love. The love of God and the love of one another. 1 John 3.16 reflects on Jesus' work on the cross, saying, This is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Wow. I mean, the statistical likelihood of any of us in this room being put in a position to actually die physically die for one of our brothers and sisters is slim. So what does that mean for us? We know, we know what it means in the work of Jesus for us, but what does it mean for how we love our brothers and sisters? How do we lay down our life for each other? I don't have an answer to that question, so I'm going to make you guys answer it. I want you to turn to each other. Just turn to the person next to you and answer that question. What does it mean to you to lay down your life for your brother or sister? You have one minute. Go. I wish I could have gone down every uh, aisle and heard your conversations. But uh, what I caught were several pieces of conversations. You know, I think that um, many of you were talking about what it means to sacrifice personally, for the good of others, what it means to give away your time to be with other people, to meet their needs, what it means to uh, offer something you have, or maybe even decide not to do something for yourself so that you can do something for other people. I think all of those are beautiful pictures of sacrifice in, in a way that we can all participate in. And, you know, what I also noticed was that several, several of you were emotional about the idea of what it means to live into that, to lay down your life, to sacrifice for each other as family. The fact that Jesus laid down his life for us to reconcile us to God the Father reminds us that things are not how they should be, that we have been distanced from God. Jesus comes in and heals that. And as we think about what it means to be a community of love, to sacrifice, to heal the wounded, to care for the stranger, we are reminded that there is still so much brokenness in this world, a brokenness that will not last forever, but is here now. 
So the first thing that I want to call your attention to is the posture of Mary in our passage. Because we can learn something from her about how to respond to this brokenness. Father Ron Rollheiser, a Catholic theologian, wrote a beautiful reflection on what we learn from Mary at the foot of the cross. He notes that sometimes artists portray Mary as prostrate at the foot of the cross. The wounded mother, helplessly distraught, paralyzed in grief, an object of sympathy, really essentially what I would look like if I were there, right? I mean, it's true. You know, the same thing for many of you. But that doesn't honor what happened there, nor teach its lesson, he says. Prostration in this situation is weakness, collapse, hysteria, resignation. In the Gospels, standing is the opposite, a position of strength. Mary stood under the cross. Still, why the silence? And why her seeming unwillingness to act or protest, he asks. Had Mary, in moral outrage, begun to scream hysterically, shout angrily at those crucifying Jesus, or physically try to attack someone who was driving the nails into Jesus' hands, she would have been replicating the very anger and bitterness that caused the crucifixion to begin with. What Mary was doing under the cross was radiating all that is antithetical to the crucifixion. Gentleness understanding, forgiveness, peace, light. That's not easy to do. Everything in us demands justice, right? Screams for it, refuses to remain silent in the face of injustice, and that's a healthy instinct, and sometimes acting on it is good. But sometimes darkness has its hour. Sometimes there's nothing that we can do to stop it, and sometimes... The blind and wounded forces of jealousy and bitterness and violence and sin cannot for that moment be stopped. But like Mary under the cross, we are asked to stand under them, not in passivity or weakness, but in strength, knowing that we can't stop the crucifixion, but we can help stop some of the hatred, anger, bitterness that surround it. Sometimes our call as followers of Christ is to be a witness to the injustice and evil. Perhaps that's a part of the sacrifice that we make when we lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. We give up our comfort at thinking everything is just fine. The second thing that we learn from this passage is that we don't do this alone. Mary isn't alone at the cross, and neither are we. In fact, In the midst of witnessing her son's agonizing death, Jesus does something incredibly profound. He puts Mary and John into a new kind of community together. A relationship characterized by self-giving love. A community that serves as an example of what all followers of Christ are called to. Mary and John in this passage and John's gospel both serve as examples of true discipleship. John is the only one of Jesus' 12 disciples to stay at the cross and risk being connected to Jesus, to risk his own life. Mary, of course, is the first disciple of Christ and the only one who has been with him literally from day one. Some people are a little surprised when I call Mary the first disciple. I didn't make it up, actually. It's really quite common. And... I really want to take a moment and walk through Mary's faith journey for a few few minutes because it seems to me like John's role in this passage is fairly obvious, but Mary is a little less so. Think about Mary's journey and what she had experienced up to this point as she stood there. Think about the first time we meet her when the angel Gabriel comes and tells her she would become pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit and give birth to the Savior of the world. And this teenage girl responds saying, With God, nothing is impossible. I am a servant of the Lord. I believe. And then she meets up with her cousin Elizabeth. And upon seeing Mary, Elizabeth loudly and suddenly proclaims, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by her Lord. What? What? What must Mary have been thinking? Next, at the temple, when she was dedicating Jesus, Simeon prophesied over her, saying, A sword will pierce your soul, and the hearts 
of many people will be revealed. We're told often that Mary pondered things. We're told here that Mary pondered this. What must she have thought of that omen, and how many times did she think back on it as Jesus grew up? Several years later, Mary would find herself again at the temple. Jesus is 12 years old, and he's been missing for three days when she finds him. And he says to her, I must be about my father's business. I must be in my father's house. Time and again, it seems that God is giving her sign after sign, calling her to faith in the work of God, both in history and in her very own life, in her very own family. After several more years, Jesus performed his first miracle at the wedding in Cana. Mary asked her son for help solving a seemingly trivial problem. They had run out of wine, and Jesus hesitates. And I love Mary's response. After Jesus essentially declines, she looks at the servants and says, Whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Right? Nike totally stole that phrase from her. Don't you wonder, though, like what had happened in their home up to that point that would cause her to react with such conviction? Did she regularly forget to buy wine? What was happening here? I don't know. She knows things, right? She has these experiences that give her this conviction. Time after time throughout her er- his earthly ministry, Mary was listed among the group of women present with Jesus, witnessing his ministry and learning from his teaching. And now here she is at the foot of the cross, witnessing his death. It's at this point that Jesus looks at Mary and John and says, here is your son, and here is your mother. I walked us through Mary's life experiences because I came across a phenomenon that made me uncomfortable as I prepared this sermon. I sifted through several Protestant commentaries, and author after author had plenty to say about John taking Mary into his care and what a good son Jesus was to think of her at a moment like that. They spoke at length about John providing for her, since we can assume she was a vulnerable widow, and now with her oldest son dying, was rendered even more vulnerable. Now, this is a beautiful part of the picture of Christian community. It's a portrait of those who have more power and more resources stepping in to ensure the safety and security of those who are easily overlooked and even targeted in society. It is a part of of community. But it's also only half the equation. It's only half a relationship. Jesus gave Mary into John's care, but he also gave John into Mary's care. Mary is the other half of this relationship. Her experience of Christ, her spiritual depth, and her value to the early church as a lifelong eyewitness can't be overestimated. There had to be something more than Jesus taking care of his mother at play. It was the Anglican and the Catholic theologians who rounded out an understanding of this passage that transcends Jesus making personal arrangements for his mom and recognized that Jesus is establishing a way in which Jesus would have his followers relate to one another as family with mutual value, mutual dependence, and mutual reliance on Jesus Christ. Now, this runs totally counter to our idea of family in America, the American nuclear family. But in all four Gospels, Jesus affirms that the faithful are truer family than our biological one. That's shocking and scandalous to so many people. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we read the story of uh, where Mary and Jesus' brothers arrive at a place that Jesus is teaching. And he responds upon their entering, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. John doesn't tell that story, opting instead to illustrate Jesus creating family out of those who stand at the foot of his cross. This is actually really good news for many people. A recent study on loneliness showed that one in four people 
have not a single person with whom they share the triumphs and trials of life. And when that study eliminated immediate family, that number jumped to 50%. Many sociologists are calling loneliness the major epidemic in today's society. As a society, we strive for greater and greater independence. Yet at the same time, we so desperately want to be a part of a community, not just any community, but a community with depth to it. And that's where we come in, brothers and sisters, because we are supposed to be that community. That is what the church is called to be about. So Jesus is commanding us, if we really want to be the church, then we better be about community. And what makes us unique, what makes us different from the YMCA or the Rotary Club, is that our community is our family. We are family because of Jesus Christ, who commands us to love one another and to demonstrate that love in how we lay down our life, how we sacrifice for our sisters and brothers. You know, I want to encourage you as you leave here to take the time to think more about this throughout the course of the week, to think about who it is that you would call outside of your biological family or the people who have been your friends for absolutely ever, but who would you call mother, father, sister, brother, son or daughter, and who would you serve in that role? How is it that you experience and contribute to the experience of this community truly being a family? The call of Jesus is to look beyond our circle, to look beyond our group of friends, to look beyond even our nuclear family, and to find in those who stand under the cross a unity and a commitment that grabs the attention of the world around us so people will say, see how they love one another? That's crazy. I want to be loved like that. And then they'll take notice of Jesus and find that he can love them just like that. That we can love them just like that. Amen? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your community, for the way in which you create family, for the way in which you call us to create family. Lord, we pray that you would help us to be aware of how it is that you would guide us toward loving others as sisters and brothers, mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, how you would guide us toward serving others in those roles, giving our time, ourselves, so that we can be a part of their family and they ours. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.